My name is Bill Moore. I'm CEO of an Austin startup. It's called Zello. And before I tell you, well, first, Zello is like uh, a CB radio. How many of you out there ever had or used a CB radio? Let me, let me see your hands. Great. Well, and you may remember it was just a, a ton of fun. So Zello is like a CB radio for your, for your phone. And before I tell you much about Zello, let me tell you a little bit about our last startup. How many in the room have heard of uh, TuneIn Radio? Any hands? Good, good. TuneIn Radio has over 40 million users a month. It's like Pandora for traditional radio. So you can listen to ESPN or BBC or your favorite local stations. And uh, TuneIn is funded by Sequoia, Google Ventures, uh, General Catalyst. It's in over 200 products like Sonos and BMW and Ford. It's been an amazing success. I worked uh, as CEO there for 10 years, and from the early days worked with uh, uh, Alex, who, along with his team, created some of the most successful TuneIn products. And while at TuneIn, we learned a lot about radio, and we learned one of the reasons, we learned why people like radio really more than music services. And it's because radio's your friend. It's live, it's local, it has people. And so over the past five years or so, Alex had been working on some instant voice software on the side with, with, along with his team. And late last fall, he decided it was time to, to make a full run at this and asked me to team up with him again. So we're working, working together again. We're both in Austin and uh, working on what we're calling social radio. Let me tell you a little bit about that. And the best way to do that may be uh, to give you a, a, quick, uh, a quick demo. Um, so I have an application called Zello uh, on my phone, and uh, uh, Zello could be used as a walkie-talkie, so you could communicate with your friends. Um, or maybe even more fun, they have these, these live channels. There's 100,000 channels that are live on, on any day. And uh, they're channels that are about a, a, a particular topic or um, really any group of friends. And so I'm looking here, there's one called the ACL Music Fest. So it's big, you know, Austin Music Festival. Or Apple Viz is for, you know, blind Apple enthusiast. Or uh, uh, a channel called The Lobby. Let me, let me turn one on and, and let you listen in. Now, this is a, a little bit risky because uh, these channels are often have bad language. It's kind of the Wild West. Uh, you know, early life out here. Fucking savage. Oh. Let's find something a little. Let's find something a little better here. Um, the channel, saying that by experience, plus you lock out a lot of people that wish to come in, and there's no way for them to contact your um your so to the channel. So this is one of the blind channels, and we'll see what they're talking about. Uh, we've created a channel called IT Expo, and I'd encourage anybody later to uh, download the app uh, and listen to that, and we could, we could have some fun with it uh, uh, as the evening goes on. So uh, Zello is, uh, uh, I guess, probably, let me frame this out. Um, Zello is social radio. That's what we've, we've called the category. You remember CB radio, you'll kind of get it. But in framing it out, I would compare it to uh, applications and, and services that are really focused on private communication, and there's lots of those. So Skype is a great example, or uh, WhatsApp, if anybody's used that, or Haytel, or Voxer, or QChat, there's lots and lots of these. And so they're typically focused on closed private communication. They typically evolve to become, you know, a, kind of a Swiss army knife that mixes uh, chat and, and text and voice and maybe even location together. And Zello isn't building yet another communication utility. It's really a new social media. And it's focused on, on public communication of the, of the kind we just heard. And that is, it, it takes advantage of the, of the power of the, of the human voice and the fact that people communicate most naturally by talking. And phones, of course, are, 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 are perfect for that. And in our example, you probably heard in a few seconds, uh, you know, what's the, what's the gender? What's the age? What's the mood? Uh, maybe even where are these people from? Um, we, we communicate most naturally through our voice, and so, uh, of course, that works great for, uh, for, a social, for social media. Now, uh, uh, eight seconds left. 
crazy traction, 6 million uniques, 20 million registered users, 48% 30-day retention, uh, apps for all the major platforms rated five stars. Um, what are we looking for? $3 million to capture and to find social radio. It's the kind of investment that's a high risk, high reward, but a great team, great traction. In addition to money, we need talent, visual design, user experience, uh, community, head of the community Bill, product gotta, marketing. Thank you very much. Off, but thank you so much. All right, Steve. It's up to you. Excellent job. Steven, you have, want to start us off? Oh, sure. You have the happy. mic. I figured I'd <laughs> let you start. Very cool. So, you know, fantastic traction. Congrats on what you've done. Thanks. You know, a big, a big item that, you know, as you look at, well, two questions real quick. Are you simply synchronous or is async as well? It's both. You can listen to messages again, but the focus is really on live communication. And that's because, uh, in the best example, maybe with Skype, you know, the pencil goes down and are they still there? Should I answer? Are they reading an email? When it's a live discussion like this, we're both in the moment, right? I mean, it's a, uh, it's a kind of communication that you just don't get to um, asynchronously. So the quick question I have is, you know, how do you filter out all the noise? If you have a broadcast channel with the ability to add multiple people, how do you filter out the noise to make sure um, the signal is clear? Yeah, that's the tricky part, which is it's, there's a lot of junk out there. And, and the stage of, the, of these channels is pretty early on, so there's, there's just lots and lots of trash. And I think a lot of it is that's, um, so we're creating a moderation uh, you know, ecosystem with channel owners and playing with different rules, trying to keep it really simple but powerful and, and understanding what works, adding a reputation system, et cetera. But, but that's really the trick in making this work well and big. John? Uh, th this is a bit of an artificial situation. You had five minutes to pitch to convey what the company is, the barriers to entry, the revenue model, the ask, the team, and the like. And you spent the first two minutes not even getting to describing exactly what the product was. Sure. Um, so just present artificial situation, but on presentation style, you didn't communicate. And given that this is a communications conference and it's a communication sure. product, it's a shame. Um, the, 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 what's, what's lost on me and what I don't understand is, if this is a fantastic idea, mm -hmm. where are the barriers to entry? Mm -hmm. And how do you make money? Well, two great questions. So the, the barriers to entry are, first, the technology isn't trivial, right? Instant live communication. And unlike something like Skype, you know, when you push the button, they need to hear you within, say, a quarter second, half a second. You know, so that, that setup's got to work. And if you, if you look in the market, there are lots and lots of similar voice social applications, and almost all of them are asynchronous. Um, so that's not a trivial barrier. Um, the second would be the nature of a social network, right, which is a winner-take-all um, and a brand that we need to develop. Um, the second question on how does it make money, today there's a B2B business, it's uh, uh, you know, 3 to $10 per month replacing Skype or Nextel. That's not really our focus. We don't really know the answer on this, on this consumer side, and it's not the, you know, the immediate focus. It's likely something around advertising and sponsorship. Okay. So, so, so the idea is build a big social network and then work out how to monetize it later? It really, it really is. And so it's, it's not an investment for everybody, but, but the companies that have uh, picked those widely are, are wisely are, are, of course, glad they did. Okay. Thanks. And Linda? All right. Well, definitely always tough to get up and do the five-minute pitch and just a bit of coaching to follow your coaching. You spent the first couple of minutes telling us how wonderful your past company was. Sure. And that's great credentials to know that we're going with a winning team, but there are a lot of one-trick stallions out there. Sure. So uh, one of those things to be careful of to not overpitch the past success. Good. Uh, question on positioning, though. You seem to rely quite a bit on uh, the old CB radios. Mm -hmm. um, I vaguely remember those. I think my dad had one. Yeah. My guess is... You're making is... me feel old now. <laughs> yeah. We'll compare numbers later. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, if you're really relying on, this is how I explain it, it is something that compares to CB radio. How are you going to deal with this with the 18-year-olds, 20-year-olds, uh, the folks that maybe didn't live during uh, that era? Well, um, I use CB radio depending on the audience, and hopefully this audience isn't insulted um, <laughs> that I use CB radio. In, in, in most, I wouldn't because people don't understand it and they, ha they haven't played with it. Um, voice Twitter doesn't quite work. 
Um, and so if you, if you view CB radio, it's, it's a great metaphor. Um, as for young people, though, you know, they don't need, they love Zello, right? It's very popular with young people because they, they love to chat. And so you don't really have to compare it to something else. You know, the friends would say, hey, come on the Zello channel, uh, and they'll have a great time. All right, so I'm going to break her one nine and push it out to the audience. <laughs> but you can't, he's asking me, yes, I was old enough. Are you kidding me? We used to sit in my father's car and be on the CB radio until the battery died. Anybody have any questions for uh, Bill from Zello? I got time for one or two. You got one, John? I normally don't give over the microphone. I learned that the hard way, but <laughs> I, I, do, I do know you, so you can hold it if you'd like. Trusted source. All right, thanks. All right, yeah, I love the concept. Radio is my favorite medium, and I agree. Where, where is the business model? I mean, the, the, the challenge I find with radio is that there's a million channels out there. Right. How do you build traffic and keep it there? I mean, we didn't hear much about an advertising model. Pay, pay radio is pretty tough to make a go at, so... Just want to, that's what we're missing, I think. Well, I think the hard part is building Thanks, the Sean. audience. Um, and then monetizing it could, can be done with audio ads like traditional radio is, or sponsorship. We've played with some ideas. Um, the, uh, many businesses would buy Zello uh, at work, which is the business product, um, for dispatchers, for cabs, for example. Well, um, as more and more you know, consumers have it, there's an entirely new business model around having consumers page a cab or book a table or models along those lines. And again, I'm careful not to overpromise. We haven't put a lot of attention into that yet, um, but there's certainly some great ideas out there. One, one last question for Bill. Um, great business, I guess, question. How have you capitalized the business to date? And when you look at the money you're trying to raise right now, how do you kind of value the business itself? Well, it's, it's really for, for uh, investors to decide, so I'll, I'll probably hedge that. We haven't raised much. Um, under half a million dollars of angel investment, you know, to get to this point. Um, and we haven't been particularly focused on a venture round. I mean, this is a, really a pitch um, for, for venture investors who are willing to take a, you know, a risky bet on something that could be very big um, or not. And, uh, and, that, and we may be another, you know, six months away before it's obvious to uh, most that that's a great bet. I have to take one more. Very, are you an entrepreneur? You're very, because you're very, because I waved you off from the other side and you went like this to me. So you get a question. First off, I want to say I am a CBer. I still have my old one. All right. Okay, that's the first thing. That doesn't make me too old. <laughs> so I do recognize that you actually have a great business model, predominantly because when people are traveling down the road, the first thing I see is that you have an autonomous opportunity with the car environment that's going out out there. There are new models being built for designing how cars are going to be able to talk to each other. This is perfect. You'd be able to be able to use that. I see a revenue model. I also see it for carriers and for resellers and for anybody who's trying to retain a customer that needs to have a small end product. This is a, a, a very low cost type probably product, but it will allow you to have retainability for your current customer base. Thanks. Very nice. Bill, you got some... I think you should talk with her. Well, that's what this, um, that's what this is all about. You thank know, you helping, so much. Thanks for waving me helping off. Helping these companies Bill. gain some new fans and, and, and you know, new contacts. So that was Great. wonderful. Thank Bill, you so much. Bill, congratulations. Can thank I you very much. Uh, have uh, the fellow from Phonism come up? I want to do a couple things. Thank you all for sticking around for the startups. I super appreciate that. I want to take one second, well, 30 seconds. Bill at Zillow.com. Try Zillow. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, while Steve comes up from Phonism, I want to thank a couple of people in this pause. One of the sponsors, Twilio, has been... Is Steve coming up? Where is he? Steve, Phonism? No? That's, this is a first. Um, there he is. Oh. And looking quite handsome. It's a man. whole... The whole okay, the, you're, you're rocking, the, you're rocking so, the hanky, So I, I just want to... Steve, totally give me one second. I want to thank Thanks. Twilio. Twilio has been the sponsor of this event for every single time since the first event in late 2010. Um, when I met them in San Francisco, told them what we were trying to do, and they jumped on immediately, and they've been with us ever since. Um, the joy of that is I've gotten to see Twilio grow from at that time. There were six people there. I think there are over 100 today, and they're now global. Uh, and they've done things for the industry that not many others have in the sense that they brought in a whole new group of people and allowed them to build applications and solutions 
in their basement, in their garage, in Starbucks, uh, in a matter of hours, minutes, hours, and days. Um, so congratulations, Twilio, and thank you for being our sponsor. Steve? And you know, they also have a really cool chief marketing officer. S Steve, you're up. Thank you. Ready? Roll the clock, please. All right. So VoIP service providers have a problem, and that's onboarding new customers. And I'm here to tell you how phonism makes that easier. Bringing on new customers is, it, is a difficult task. It should be easy for you and forgettable for them. If it's difficult, they're going to remember. It took forever to get set up with these guys. Now, one of the major parts of onboarding for service providers is phone provisioning. And if that, <clears throat> uh, phones have to be configured for your servers and customized for the, for the uh, set up for the customer with the right extensions, dial plans, directories, and so forth. Provisioning is their first exposure to your service. And if that doesn't go well, everybody hurts. At the end of the day, if their CEO can't make a call, you may lose the customer or your reputation could be damaged. But provisioning is not an easy thing to get right. Look around you. I mean, here at IT Expo, how many phone manufacturers are exhibiting? They all have their own style of configuration. They're all di they all have their own product lines and different feature sets. And if you're a service provider and you want your customers to be able to use any of those endpoints or all of them, you got to be able to provision them. So you have a few options. You can spend the time and money to provision and support every new IP phone that comes on the market. You can narrow your support down to just a few models or, and brands, or you can use a third-party platform and let somebody else worry about the details of provisioning. So this is how Phonism takes care of onboarding <clears throat> and provisioning. Phonism is two components, our software agent and our web application. When you use Phonism, all your customers have to do is install our software agent anywhere on their network and plug their phones in. The agent takes care of the rest. It automatically discovers the phones and sets them to be provisioned by our web service. And our web service in, turns, in turn returns the correct configuration to the phones. And you use our web application to manage and monitor each one of those phones. Now, the agent provides a secure link between the phones and our web application. So you get advanced management features that you didn't have before, like endpoint monitoring. If an endpoint goes down, you'll know it before your customer calls you. So, so with, with, with Phonism, uh, onboarding and provisioning new customers is easy. You won't have to manually edit configuration files ever again. You can manage all your customers' endpoints from a single unified interface, and phones no longer have to be pre-provisioned. They can be drop shipped directly to the customer and customers can bring their own devices. With all this, you can focus on your core business as a service provider rather than spending time provisioning endpoints. Now, we're not here to say that our solution solves every provider's problem either, but there are over a thousand service providers in the US alone with total revenues exceeding a billion dollars. And the majority of those are small providers and a lot of those guys are open source based and those are the guys we're targeting first. Most larger providers already have their own provisioning solutions, but small providers end up, st they're, they're stuck playing catch up with the big boys because they, they don't have the resources to build their own. And those are the guys who hurt the most when they lose a customer. With phonism, they can simplify and reduce the complexities and costs of onboarding. We built phonism to scratch our own itch. My brother Nico felt the pains of provisioning when he was deploying VoIP at his day job. So we teamed up to solve them. And here's where we are today. We released a private beta with a single customer earlier this year. We've gotten great feedback at trade shows and VoIP meetups. We formed partnerships with phone manufacturers. We've written over 40,000 lines of code, and we have over 100 potential customers signed up for our next beta to be released by the end of the year. And all of this was done on nights and weekends. We're moving, we just need money to move faster. So, we're looking for investment capital to boost our marketing, sales, and engineering efforts in order to accelerate our growth. We're also looking for partners. If you're struggling with endpoint management or would like to incorporate phonism into your products or service, services, please come see us at the show. Thank you very much.
That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, John, you want to kick it off? Nice, crisp presentation within the time. Understand what you do. Um, can you touch a little bit on how you charge? So the revenue side and also um, what you, if you're raising capital, what you're looking to raise. Okay. So uh, on, the, on the charging side, we're still playing with that. Um, it's going to be a subscription model, but I can't tell you a price yet. We're still talk, getting feedback from the market, but we're basing it, you know, based on the amount, either based on the amount of endpoints that you're managing or somewhat how big the, your service provider, how many customers you have, we're going to charge you a monthly fee. So it'll be subscription based. Um, as far as how much we're looking to raise, we're looking to raise anywhere from 600 to a million, uh, 600,000 to a million dollars. For what purpose? So we believe that um, we can ship our, our second beta within the next three months and, and ship product within six months. So that we, we need the money so that we can uh, essentially hire more, a, a few more people and go full time because this is all nights and weekends now. It's been like that for, we've been on the project for a little over two years now, nights and weekends. Very so impressive. we're very dedicated to it. <laughs> Steve? Cool, yeah, so on that point, congrats on what you've done working Thank nights you. and weekends. But as an investor or a potential partner or customer, why should they trust you guys as a team if you haven't sort of gone out and left your day job for this? And it seems as if you're waiting for a security blanket before you go out and do it. It brings up a question of how much do you believe in it? Well, that, that, give that's, everything up. That's, a great, that's a great question, and um, I was expecting that question. And the only answer, the, the only answer I have is honesty. Um, we're all, we're, none of us are young. We're all married with children. And uh, we can't leave our day jobs. So that's why we've been on this for over two years. We're definitely dedicated to the problem and solving it. But I, I, can't, uh, I can't quit my job and not be able to support my family. So I'm doing it the hard way. I'm not, I'm not eating ramen noodles. I can't. I just, that's, yeah, that's just the truth. <laughs> Linda? All right, thanks. So you had given us what looks like the total available market is somewhere around 1,000 providers, and you already have 100 in your beta, so it's awesome you're getting that much feedback. Where do you go after you get the next 900 on the beta and absolutely love the product? Seems like a kind of a small market. Well, so we're targeting open source providers first because we're looking at integrating it with um, uh, small, uh, some of the open source PBXs and stuff. And I think that um, uh, provisioning is a problem, for endpoint provisioning is a problem for the market as a whole. Um, uh, PBX manufacturers could use a product like this because a lot of the PBX manufacturers, especially the open source ones, the tools that are in there, they really lack a lot of features. So that's a potential market we can grow into as well as just kind of grow into bigger, bigger service providers as well. Okay, do we want to open up to the audience? I, have this, this mic. Can you hear me? No. I cannot hear you. You cannot? Now you can. Uh, yeah, let's open it up. I, I noticed walking around that some people are taking some notes. I think that's a good idea. In about 15 minutes, you'll get to cast one vote for one of these four startups. And also, keep in mind, you don't need to be a venture capitalist to invest in these companies. It's not uncommon for private investors to take a small position in any of these early stage companies if you're not happy with what you're getting at the bank, for instance. You have a question, sir? Uh, I do. Uh, good presentation. Thank uh, you. At some point, you're going to have to leave your day job. Mm -hmm. So why not just simply license what you've created already, open source it, up the ante, ask for more money, and start to develop unified communications applications and, and create a real company out of this. Thank you. Uh, that, that, that's, uh, that's an interesting suggestion. We haven't thought about open sourcing the, uh, the product. That may be something that we, we should entertain uh, in order to, uh, to move forward, if that's what it's going to take. Good, suge good suggestion. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Do you have something else, or I'll go to the next question? Well, I was just going to say, go we're ahead. willing to do whatever it takes to move forward. That's essentially the position we're in right now. And so. right now, there's just the three of you? Uh, yeah, and we have another friend of ours that's working, and he's part-time. He just started a few weeks ago with us, but he's ex really excited about the product, so he's giving his personal time. So what roles do each of you play? So if you have four people on this product project, what roles are you each playing? 
Okay, so uh, my, my, Bill and I, I didn't know if the names were still up there. Bill and I are, my friend, our friend Bill Edgington and I are in the engineering side. And my brother is doing most of the marketing and business development. And the fourth friend? And the fourth friend? Uh, he's a developer as well. So we just brought him on for, for some technical help. Yeah. Okay, got one more question over here for Stephen. Um, with the agent that you're putting out at the customer premise, beyond just device provisioning, does that agent actually do some diagnostics around what's going on with the land environment and the devices themselves? Not yet. We have, the, we have those things on our roadmap, though. Yeah, we, we do so, have those things on our roadmap. So Just one, hit him if he gets in the way. Yeah, so one thing would be if, <laughs> if you were thinking about expanding your market, many of the feature servers have device provisioning mm -hmm. modules, like a, you know, a, a device management, but you might be able to differentiate by expanding on the functionality to diagnose what's going on within the line okay. and the broadband connection with that, because you're putting an agent out, which is kind of unique. It's yeah, yeah, that's, I think that's what sets us apart mostly because we have, from the cloud, you can manage the, the local network and the local endpoints. So we give you a direct link in there. Yeah, thank any, you. Any other questions on the panel here? Are we good? I'm gonna take one more from the audience. Um, Sorry. Thanks, Larry. Uh, quick question. Uh, first of all, a great presentation. I think you, uh, you guys are onto something. Uh, Thank what you. is out there is not working very well. Um, where are you based and uh, where are you guys looking to, uh, to grow this company? Uh, we're out of Tampa, Florida. Okay. Very good. Thanks. All right, so we move on. So to the well, let's move on. Yeah, thank you. We, I know that there are a few more questions, but there's also a few more presenters. All the startups will be here at the as soon as everyone uh, finishes. Uh, we can take a few more questions or at the end, or you're very welcome to come up to the stage to ask the startups the questions. Stephen, and congratulations. Well prepared. Thank well. Thank you very much. And I'm going to ask that you keep the timer going after the five. We're showing how long after the presentation. So if you'll keep that so going. So Dave from VSnap is. Is this and, and while uh, we're waiting for Thank Dave, I want to remind everybody uh, what Larry was talking about. We're all going to have a chance to vote for our favorite startup at the end, and we'll actually be able to see the results. So if you, if you want to take notes or think about what you're seeing, that'd be great. And I'm just going to take one second to thank the guys from CBON for also being involved again this year. They've been involved a few times. Is Jeff Uphuse still in the building somewhere? Jeff, are you here? Uh, Jeff, Jeff uh, has been a big supporter of the event. Um, uh, Jeff's uh, uh, been with CBeyond, I think, a little bit more than a year. And, and he's someone, if you don't know him, you should meet. He's someone who personifies what it means to be an entrepreneur inside of a large company and really make change. And, you know, not long before he joined, CBeyond was traditionally really known for great voice services, among other things. And in a short period of time, they've become recognized for what they're doing in the cloud services market for something like 60,000 small business customers. And they do business in more countries than they do in states, which was surprising to me. But thank you very much, Jeff and CBeyond. Dave, it's all yours. Great. Thanks, Larry. So um, my name is Dave McLaughlin. I'm the CEO and one of the founders of vSnap. And I'd like to just start with a little um, old school interactive exercise. Uh, I'm interested to know how many people think that making customers feel special is a good thing versus the number of people who believe that that's an absolute imperative. So you think making customers feel special is good? You think it's an absolute necessity in today's business? It's a very enlightened crowd. <laughs> so um, we often describe the problem that we solve as customer communications are broken, but I realize in this environment, all of you are like, wait, that's what my company does. <laughs> So specifically, we think that um, businesses are kind of trapped in text. We're not talking about advertising or, or broadcast communications, but really in all those little um, you know, interactions, one-to-one -one interactions in the sales process and then post-purchase and account management and that kind of thing, businesses tend to be stuck in email, and um, there are a few problems with email. One, very high noise. I don't think that needs to be over-described. We all kind of get that problem, and um, it's a problem that's getting worse, not better. But the really, um, what I think is the really interesting problem is the way that text doesn't capture tone, emotion, warmth, sincerity, all these nonverbal things that really are essential to how we communicate complex information and how we build trust and how we 
form feelings and shape, dri and, shape and drive our buying decisions. And so um, when you have that situation, engagement falls. And if you're not creating an emotional connection with the customer, then as soon as your competitor has something that's faster, stronger, bigger, shinier, cheaper, whatever, you'll experience churn. And that problem is exacerbated because we're dealing with the most empowered customers literally in the history of humankind. Just swimming in perfect information, they can make a decision with the click of a mouse, and everything they feel, whether positive or negative, flows immediately to their social networks. So what we do is we give you an easy little system to record, share, and measure short video messages, not more than a minute, as a more personal, emotionally more rich alternative to email or text. You can record a vSnap from an iOS or Android device or from the web. You can add attachments. You can, uh, your, the person you send it to can watch it on any browser. You can share a notification via uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, or email, and we'll add Facebook and SMS as we go forward. And then you have some simple measurement on did recipients take action, did they watch it, did they take action on the links that you paired with it, and we're about to add a set of measurements on actually how they felt about what you sent. So here's what that looks like. The top half of the frame kind of shows your, your feed on the website, and you have some of that measurement information and so forth, and then the bottom is just a glance at, uh, at those mobile apps. But what's really important is how it feels. And what the metaphor that customers keep using when they tell us about this is that what it feels like is the modern equivalent of a handwritten note. I love that because my mom sends a lot of handwritten notes, so I know exactly how that feels. But this is even better because, again, it captures all that nonverbal stuff, that tone and enthusiasm and all those things that really drive decisions. And more importantly, it's better because it's measurable. And that measurability is really critical. That's what kind of keeps this from just being... Dave talking about squishy stuff. Because we've seen in multiple tests that you can measure a lift. That recipients are somewhere between 33 and 41% more likely to take action when you reach them via vSnap as compared to reaching them via email. And it's one of those things, you build these tests and then you go, of course they are. If I'm gonna reach out to you in a way that has enthusiasm and all this nonverbal stuff, of course you're gonna take action at a higher rate. But the other interesting thing is people bring their feelings to their social networks and they evangelize. When you reach people via vSnap, they tend to get really zealous about your business and evangelize to their social networks. So I just want you to think about this as we wrap up on kind of big mega trends that this sits on top of. Obviously, device adoption and then mobile video consumption. Obviously, the cloud and the app ecosystems that sit on top of this. But the big one really is that customer empowerment trend that Tony Shea and the Net Promoter Score uh, folks really kind of prophesied and really led the curve on and these customer centric management strategies that sit on top of that. When you want to make customers feel special, when you see that as essential to the growth of your business, you stop and you say, I, I, I don't actually have that many tools to help me do that. So that's what we're doing is building this big business on top of this very simple idea that you have to make your customers feel special. Thanks. Very, very nice. Um, Want to kick us off? That's sure. I took the microphone, so I got to go first this time. The, uh, in terms of target audience, then, it seems like there are a wide number of uses for this. What is your market entry strategy, and how are you going to penetrate the market? Sure. Um, so we put a, a kind of first application up about a year ago, and we just ran all sorts of different tests in different verticals, different size companies, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what we found is that there are two beachheads. There are kind of three beachheads where the what I call the get it factor is really high, like it doesn't need to be explained. One is healthcare, um, because patient engagement and patient non-adherence is a big problem. But HIPAA compliance is a big barrier there for us, so we haven't started there. We have some pilots happening in Europe with uh, pharma companies so that we can continue to explore that without making it our primary focus. The other two are recruiters looking to use this tool to um, engage passive candidates in a more personal way and bring people into the hiring funnel at a higher rate. And then the other one is just web companies where the problem is really acute because all their business is done through the interface of the web. Creating that personal connection is um, an even more acute problem. And so we actually just last week, and we'll announce it next week, signed our first big enterprise deal with a, an online education company. Got it. And just a, a compliment to you for also bringing the numbers into it. Uh, selling on emotion and a nice to have is hard to do, but it's great to see you have some quantitative evidence around the value. Thanks. Gotcha. And this is more of a product-related question. 
But what I struggle with is, why do businesses need to go with vSnap? I mean, I get there's some stuff that you bring in terms from a measurement perspective, but is there, I mean, what are the key areas that differentiate you from me, me just using my webcam or my phone to send a video message to somebody else? Sure, I mean. you track how many times I viewed it, right? So what, uh, other do, what else do you bring beyond that? Yeah, I guess, I guess you know, we look at that and say, um, you know, it has to be very easy to record, very easy to share, very easy to receive, and then very easy to sort of measure and manage. And we think there's like meaningful amounts of friction to take out of each piece of that. And that's what we're focused on. Do you see this primarily, a couple of questions here. First one, do you see this primarily as a business reaching out to its customer or customers reaching into the business as sort of initiating the message? So f sure, yeah. first question. So um, because we've been able to quantify the lift for business users, we, we're able to sort of articulate the value proposition to them more explicitly than we are to consumers in terms of reaching out to businesses. But the real answer is whoever has intent is the one that uses it. So if I send you a vSnap, John, maybe it's because I want to get a meeting with you, I'm going to be in New York, whatever it is, you are not so likely to respond to me in vSnap because you might not have showered yet. I mean, there's all these kind of reasons why you might not. But since I have intent and since I have a specific goal to get a meeting with John, you know, using it makes sense for me. So that's just a conceptual answer. The, the expression of that answer is probably it starts with businesses reaching out to customers. Um, again, with B2B businesses that we've seen so far, it tends to be pre-purchase. And with B2C businesses, it tends to be post-purchase, handling customer service issues in ways that feel uh, more attentive, more thoughtful, that kind of thing. What concerns me about this is a similar reason why I think that you know, video telephony has been a much slower um, uh, sort of start than, than we've seen over the last 50 years that the technology has been available. And, and that is, um, I remember when answer phones first came out, and my parents kind of hated leaving a message, and people always had trouble recording that first message. And I think we've got over that audio hurdle, but the, the video hurdle of, is the light right? You know, oh no, I've got to start again. You know, so... Anything that's audio and video has a beginning, a middle, and end. It's a story that you're telling. Whereas text, people have, you know, expected to get short, truncated phrases back, you know, even to the point of, you know, three-letter or five-letter responses back to a very long email they have. So my concern is that you're asking for quite a big behavioral change for people to adopt this, and that, that could be a big friction point for you. Yeah, it, you know, smart point, it's not easy. Um, I'd say a few things. One, our belief is that given kind of device adoption and given the efficacy of the behavior, um, this behavior is coming from our perspective. So we don't think this is really a conversation about is uh, easy, ubiquitous video messaging going to be a, a common behavior in, in business. We think that it is. Uh, we really think it's about, like, how is that going to feel? And, in, and the way that I characterize that is, is it going to feel like somebody figured out how to put a commercial in my inbox? because I, I won't watch them? Or is it going to feel like somebody took some time and, and sent me that sort of modern handwritten note? So I think there's a lot of nuance there to your point. Now, now what we found is um, what's really effective here, what's really effective is using the vSnap to exp express a shared belief. So it's this kind of Simon Sinek start with why idea of, John, I'm Dave McLaughlin, I'm the CEO of vSnap. I think that we share an interest or belief in um, you know, systems that help businesses grow in a customer-centric way, and I'd love to get 20 minutes on the phone with you. Here's who I am, here's the belief we share, and here's the action I'd like you to take. And so we've really become kind of very, like, um, evangelical in coaching people about this is the anatomy of a vSnap. So you're not wrong. It takes, uh, it takes some real explicit coaching. It's, it's one of those behaviors that seems obvious but needs a little more instruction than that, but we think we understand how to teach it. All right, to our audience. Sure. Um, I, I have one question, actually, if I'm allowed. Um, you mentioned, and you may not be able to answer, but you, you mentioned at one point that you were getting close to being able to offer the customer or the user of eSnap some insight into how the receiver felt. Is there anything that you could share about that? Sure. It's pretty simple, actually. Um, so I, I said to John that the, the, the hurdle of a, res, a, respondent, a recipient responding in a vSnap form is a pretty high hurdle. And so we wanted to introduce some um, medium level of engagement data where the recipient could indicate how they felt about the vSnap that you sent without having to actually turn on the camera and 
take a shower and shave or whatever else goes into recording one. And also because, you know, the behavior people still need to learn. Um, so we've basically just started to build and we've, we've prototyped already um, a simple system where I can say, thanks, that was valuable, thanks, that was thoughtful, or thanks, that was amazing. So that we're kind of indicating the type of, we're, we're starting to get some data on feelings that are created and also some, um, you know, the kind of sense of reward that happens when you form a habit, when you let the sender know a little bit more how it was received, then he or she is likely to use it more. What people really get addicted to sending these things, Larry, is when they get that gushing response. If I send you one, and actually you and I have had this exchange, where, where that person on the other end is like, wow, that f thank you so much, um, then you go, oh, I'm going to do more of this. Let, let me, I might have one question I have to ask, because there's a similar service that isn't really picking traction. Uh, do I have to go to a vSnap app or a vSnap website in order to view and deliver this, this mess? This to receive it, or are you asking to receive it or to send it? Well, either way, um, you know, do I, you know, am I getting it in my inbox where I'm clicking it on the email, or do I have to go to a site, go to your website, go to, and then if I want to resend one, you know, how am I interfacing with your application? There's a, there's a bunch of questions in there, so let me do my best Sorry and then tell me what I'm missing. Um, so in order to send a vSnap, you have to have a membership with us. It's a free service. The business model is a freemium business model. will be interesting. Actually, that first enterprise deal we did, we've already sold um, this set of premium features that we're building now, even though we haven't built them yet. Um, so you have to... Uh, classic. Good work. Uh, so you have, to, well um, you have to be, you know, you have to have an account. It's free in order to send one. The recipient receives either a Twitter notification, a LinkedIn notification, or an email notification. So I don't want this crowd to think that this is strictly video via email. It's a broader, uh, you know, tool than that. And then he or she clicks through the link and consumes it on, at, you know, where it's hosted on our URL. They do not have to sign in or download anything uh, in order to do that. If they want to reply, then they need to set up an account. And actually, we're going to relax that a little bit. Okay. okay. Thank you. That's take exactly a couple, couple of questions here. Who owns the intellectual property, the copyright on the video, and how can that be managed at the sending and receiving ends? Sorry, how can that be managed what? At the sending and receiving ends. Yeah. Um, our belief is that you, the user, own your own videos. And so um, I think that's the simple answer to that question. It, it's, as, it's as private or as portable as an email, essentially. If you send one to me, then I'm the only one who sees it. I may also forward it or share it on to my Twitter following or whatever, um, but, but that's the sort of same expectations as you have with email. Just over here. Just wondering, what are the barriers to entry and what would someone stop someone else from doing what you do? Sure, yeah. Um, we, we have filed a full patent, US and European, on this idea of attaching things to a video message. So our construct was to say, Again, um, this isn't video attached to an email or some other vehicle. Video in our construct is the chassis, and then you can add other attachments, links, et cetera, to that. And then as a separate independent action, a notification can be delivered to the recipient. So that kind of intellectual construct um, is the basis for our IP filing. But, but really, um, you know, we won't know from the patent office for another couple of years whether we get that, and the business will be on its way or dead by then anyway. Um, so really, it's about focus, just like Mike said in the, in the keynote, it's about focus and about really expressing, you know, user insights that come from getting down in the details with users, expressing them in the features of the product, and, um, and, and really building engaged users in usership around that. Last question over here. Congratulations, Dave. It looks like you had a great year with some great awards that you won, and you got 750000 in seed money in July, it looks like. How much money are you looking for now? What is the return on investment, and what are you using with the uh, proceeds? Well, I think the return on investment is TBD. Uh, we are um, we're raising a, a bit more angel money, another uh, $750,000. We want to focus explicitly on three things. One is making the application stickier. Two is um, showing, you know, uh, more focused traction within those specific beachheads. And three is monetizing with enterprise deals and turning on the, the, um, the premium features that allow us to monetize with individual users and SMBs as well. But we want to show that we can sell this both ways. So that's where our focus is now. Dave, super job. You handled a lot of difficult questions. Cheers. Thank Thanks. you very much. Congratulations. Well done.
Uh, I'm going to call up our last presenter, Howard, while he's coming to the stage. I also just want to thank and welcome a new sponsor this year, the Ditan Group. Is Liz here? Do you, can you stand up? This is Liz from Ditan, if anyone wants to talk to them. And um, I recently met with the, uh, thank you Liz, the, the founder of Ditan. It's a company out of Brazil, actually. He explained to me that they operate in the Silicon Valley of Brazil. I think we often forget how much entrepreneurial activity there is outside of our country. And uh, Ditan helps many companies, maybe in this very room, but certainly in this commu community, by doing, taking some of the very hard chores of product development outside and, and doing um, carrier grade product development in Brazil on their behalf. I have really enjoyed getting to know them and uh, you should as well. Howard, it's all yours. Thanks, Larry. Hi, I'm Howard Brown. I'm CEO and founder of Ring DNA. Um, I'm a three-time founder. I've had two successful exits. And um, I built a product, we built a product called Ring DNA. And uh, for the last 12 years of my life, I've been working in the enterprise software space, kind of at the intersection of sales, marketing, and customer support together with telephony. And the idea behind Ring DNA is, let's face it, while our smartphones have gotten much more powerful, they truly haven't made our conversations any smarter. And that thing on our desk that rings, that's not making our conversations any smarter either. So let's talk about the problems that exist out there. Well, from a marketing standpoint, web marketing has exploded. Um, According to a recent study, $40 billion in online ad spend every year just to generate phone calls. The problem is web marketing is great if you fill out a web form, but if you pick up the phone, you lose all that tracking. Sales reps spend 24% of their time researching to prepare for calls. They're looking up, they're looking into their CRM system, they're looking at uh, support tickets, they're looking at what their customers have purchased in the past. And typical support agents are actually toggling between six different systems during a call. So we have sales, we have support, and we have marketing all facing a challenge. And that is none of them have rich contextual data that is actionable at the time of a phone call. Meanwhile, the customer, and we're all customers, we just want to talk to the right person when we're calling into a company. We want to make sure our call is routed to the person who can address our questions. So what did we do? We built basic call tracking to, into CRM. And what does that mean? Using actually Twilio API, we're able to provision phone numbers on the fly integrated to Google AdWords, and then build that into Salesforce.com or any other CRM system. Now, why did we do this? Well, it's great if we get phone calls, but phone calls don't tell me anything about revenue. And a phone call is not going to tell me how, many, how much I spent on advertising led to actual opportunity. When we build Ring DNA, which is actually a platform and we build it into a CRM technology, and you go on a website, and you've searched something, we actually display a phone number based on how you searched for that product. And then that call is actually routed to the right rep with that information, with the marketing information. So let me show you what, what I mean. Uh, you'll see below, we've actually launched Ring DNA as an iPad application, since the iPad is everywhere within businesses today. And what happens is, w when your customer calls, or when a lead calls, that data, that rich contextual data, whether it's salesforce.com CRM data, whether it's customer support data, social media data like Facebook, LinkedIn, the keyword data that will pop a script is all presented to you on your iPad, on your iPhone, or on your browser. So the idea here is that with this data that currently lives in silos between sales, marketing, support, 
That data is all brought to you at the most important moment, the time of the call. It's not only brought in, but as you place calls outbound, you're presented with that information as well. So Ring DNA today, we closed around to 1.1 million in July. We launched our iPad application at Dreamforce, which is the salesforce.com event a, a couple weeks ago. Um, we have 100 companies currently using our product, fairly large companies, and we had over 1,500 installs from the Apple Store in just over eight days. So here's a list of our companies that are currently using it. Uh, obviously, some very big names. Just to quickly understand, all you have to do to use Ring DNA is be a Salesforce customer, OAuth into your Salesforce account, we provision you a phone number, and all of your data is magically there. So we've built a rock star team of developers that uh, exist in the enterprise uh, software world, uh, international telecom, and a lot of uh, iPad, iOS application development as well. And we're hiring. So what's next? Expand our base. I'm out of time, so I'll, I'll wait for the uh, panel to ask. Thank you very much. Sure. John? So just to segue into that, how much do you charge? So we charge $49 per month, thank you for <laughs> answering the question, per user. And um, do you think there's an opportunity to do, it, do you think it, it, there'll just be one price point, $49 per month, or do you think there's opportunities to expand to higher price points yeah, over time? Yeah, I think there's opportunities. We've already seen, because we are a platform, and right now we provide data from Google Maps and CRM and Zendesk and Marketo, but we've also seen people say, hey, we need information from some of our applications. We need information from this data source. So what we see today is being able to charge for the information that we're providing standard, but then upcharging for additional applications as well. So if, if you'll just run me through the number. You said you had 1,500 downloads. Correct. You're charging $50 Those per month. Those are free. So Those are free downloads. Clear, we, we provide the application, which includes a phone number, 200 free minutes, and the ability to get all your CRM data as well as your social data. You get 30 minutes additional free each time you share the application with somebody. Okay. So what are revenues running at at the moment? So revenues, we started this, we launched this two weeks ago. So we're negotiating with some of the companies you've seen um, on, our, uh, on, on the slide that showed the logos. Okay. Thanks. So cool idea. I'm a big believer in context around all phone dialogue. So you're definitely going in a direction that I am a big fan. I think there's a large opportunity there. The issue is I've seen a lot of companies try to do bits and pieces. And they've struggled with just getting a critical mass of users. Mm -hmm. And they, they come back to me and they say, that we need to be integrated within the OS of a system, of a phone, to do this appropriately. So what's your go-to-market strategy in sort of getting these customers in? Absolutely. So um, as I said earlier, I, I've worked in the Salesforce.com ecosystem for quite a while. And we have, and all of my angel investors have either came directly out of the Salesforce.com ecosystem or the service providers um, of that ecosystem. And we've seen a huge pent-up demand because people are really interested in call tracking, really interested in having the CRM data on these tablets or on the iPhone. So what we're doing right now, as I mentioned, we basically are seeding sales reps within these larger enterprise. They're seeing the value. Their calls are automatically logged. Their performance goes up. Uh, and, and so the idea is to take that, leverage it to sales management as well as marketing teams. Got so you're looking to penetrate with the initial sort of early user base and bring it up to the IT department. Correct. With traction. Yeah, like a box.net. Gotcha. Yeah, two questions on that. Um, first of all, it is uh, starting with a freemium model and then enabling people to upgrade. Do you see any issues with the fact that this is kind of in that consumerization of IT space, but yet the three markets you talk about, the customer service, the sales, and the marketing, those have all traditionally been much more top-down purchases of systems, including SFDC? Yeah, great question. And actually, if you look at Salesforce today, what Salesforce fears the most is companies like Evernote, 
or Dropbox or Box.net that are actually doing the consumerism of the enterprise software. And what they fear is that the master record data lives outside of Salesforce. So actually there's a huge opportunity. If I'm a, if I'm a sales guy or a support guy, I want things as simple as my Gmail. I want things as simple as my Evernote. And that's what we're doing. We're presenting that in a UI on my tablet, on my iPhone. And then just a question in terms of when you look at those three marketplaces, which one do you think will be the first one to be uh, penetrated? Oh, that's a great question. I, we see a lot of stuff happening with the sales reps initially, and maybe that's because we launched at Salesforce and 80% of their customer base is sales reps. But we've also seen some call centers that are really interested in going from the keyword all the way to the performance of their reps and seeing the return on investment there. Yeah, I think the, the, marketing, uh, the, the marketing departments are really going to be interested in being able to see that. Uh, it'll be interesting. The provisioning of that will be interesting to see if you can keep up with the demand. I want to push yep, it out to before, you, Larry. Yeah, a couple questions before we go to voting. We'll start over here. What happens if there's not a hit in the database, a new phone number? Absolutely. So what happens today is we search the variety of databases, whether it's whitepages.com, your CRM application, and so on. You're presented with the phone number that creates either a lead or contact in your Salesforce record. And then during the call, you're obviously going to collect that data. Uh, yes. Um, the question that I have is, um, it sounds like the database that you're presenting is giving a more informed um, you know, individual that's going to be conducting a phone call. Can you express in words how that takes the experience from the concept of commodity service into personalized service? Yeah, so I think uh, the commodity service is obviously minutes on the phone. Um, I think the value add here is obviously the data. And the data drives business decisions as well as drives uh, a more informed rep, be it an agent, support, so on. So for example, with us, because we're integrated with the keyword data, we actually can smart route calls to the right rep based on their experience in selling a particular product or service from the keyword that that individual searched. So I, I really do think it's value add around the basic commodity, which is the connection to te telephony. Any other questions? Up here? Uh, oh, how, how much are you trying to raise? Uh, so we're currently trying to raise between four and six million dollars. Okay, Howard? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. You know, Larry, I just want to say all of the uh, presenters, you know, all four of them from top to bottom today, out of all of the startup camps that I've been to and that I participated in, f I, I really believe that the, today's uh, presenters were literally from top to bottom the best presenters. There's, uh, for the first time, I really feel like there's, no, there's nobody here who either mailed it in or really didn't try real well. So I want to, on behalf of the panelists, I think I really want to thank the presenters for really knocking the ball out of the park today. So thank you guys very much. And so um, we're going to bring up um, a screen here uh, that is a little SMS application we've been using, I think, almost since day one um, that the folks from Twilio coded up for us uh, last night. And I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. Uh, all entrepreneurs need uh, some sort of fundraising and investors and so on. Number one, what is the best way to find an investor or somebody that will provide funding? And number two, what kind of collateral would they require? You know, and having been through that, I'll go uh, real quick because I, yeah. I want to respond to it. Number one, the best way to find funding is through your professional contacts. To start, if you really don't know where to begin, start with your own lawyer or your own accountant and the people they know. And look for lawyers and accountants in your town that are in the startup ecosystem. In terms of what they need, uh, no more than a two-page executive summary. If they're interested, they will, that will get them enough interested to, to read your business plan. But 
if you can't explain your business in two page pages, they're not going to want to listen to it. Yeah, and one thing I would add to that is the traditional construct of a business plan being a very formal written document, you know, the, the long hand of everything about your business is being very quickly replaced by the pitch deck, which summarizes uh, that business plan. Um, I'm just going to uh, ask, oh no, go ahead, I didn't realize. John, go ahead, and, yeah, then, please. We're gonna, and then we're going to vote. So, and a pitch deck is no more than 12 slides. With large, font, <laughs> with large font. <laughs> it's Thank you, guys. So, um, yeah, this is very simple. I can assume that everyone has a cell phone. Um, and uh, all you need to do, you can vote once. Uh, the phone number on top there. And send one of those four digits to that phone number. Uh, it's... A little bit out of order, unfortunately, from the um, from the order that they presented. So you'll have to think a little bit. But but uh, if you vote, and then as the votes start to come in, right, it's from the bottom up. So Zello was our first, and it'll, V Snap it'll, it'll, was second. Actually, yeah, just just don't think about the order. Just think about the company. <laughs> well, if you can. And, okay. And 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 um, it's changed again. All right, here we go. Also, while you guys are voting, I also I don't want to leave out. Uh, oh, what's happening? Whoa, 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 whoa! What's happening? That is a bad trick. <laughs> Do over. <laughs> Oops. We might have to do a show of hands. <laughs> Let's don't we, you know what? Technology is great when it works. All Let's, right, could somebody give us the official numbers that we should be texting? I, besides, I know it's one, two, and three, and four, but which companies go okay, to which digit? We're going to do a show of hands. Ready? <laughs> I need yes, uh, all of you with, can you see? I know it's blinding, but you're going to be responsible for deciding how the biggest show of hands. Are you ready? We are ready. Are you all ready? John? Yeah. You're ready. Those who are voting, this is for the number one for the winner. Those voting for Zello. Oh, my God. Nice counting. Got it. He's like an SMS. So, uh, those voting for phonism. Thomas, tell me when you're done. <laughs> Let's not disturb Forrest. <laughs> okay. Those voting for, I'm only going slowly because I can't remember who's next. Those voting for V-Snap. V -snap. Keep your hands up. Okay. And lastly, remember, you can only vote once. I hope I said that before. Um, <laughs> yeah, those voting <laughs> for Ring DNA. And when we're done, would everybody from Florida who can't, doesn't know how to vote raise your hand? <laughs> oh, the, I'm feeling a hanging chad. That's all I can say. Okay, Thomas, while you tabulate and put it in my pocket or something, I, I also I, I don't want to forget. There's one other sponsor who helped bring the evening together. It's uh, the guys from Shango, who I think are sitting over here. Uh, they're Austin-based startup as well. A little bit more mat more more mature, uh, but very exciting company in the wholesale telco space. Um, they are in the exhibit hall. I encourage you to go visit them uh, tomorrow. Thomas. And they're good guys and girls. We have to do it again. No, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. And the winner is... And the winner of Startup Camp number six, 
by very, very close margin, at least by Thomas's calculation, is ring DNA. And with that, I want to thank everybody for spending the evening with us. I want to thank all of the startups who prepared so diligently. I want to thank Gary. I want to thank Linda. I want to thank Stephen. I want to thank John. I want to thank the audio and visual people. And I wish you a great evening. And uh, we'll see you in Miami. Thank you. Oh, and I invite anyone who wants to come and chat with any of the startups or any of the panelists, please come on up to the stage. You can hop up on the stage down here, whatever you like. But uh, please come and chat with them.